Thanks once again for joining us online. We are praying for you all that uh, attend regularly and pray that one day shortly that we can be back together. But we're grateful for the technology that we do have uh, to be able to share today uh, what God has given to us. And I pray that you open your Bibles and follow along this morning and see what God has for us together. As we prepare to get back together in the upcoming weeks, uh, we look forward to hearing what God has done in your lives and uh, sharing what God has done in and through the people of New Life Baptist Church. If you're tuning in, we're grateful uh, if you're visiting with us. We're grateful that you've chose to uh, tune in today, and we'd love to connect with you. You can send an email or text the phone number on the website. We'd be glad to uh, talk to talk to you more about uh, New Life Baptist Church. Let's open this morning with a word of prayer and go to the Lord. Lord God, we thank you and praise you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for your word that's been forever settled in heaven. And Lord, that you've preserved it and given it to us. Lord, that we can go into it uh, this morning open it and Lord learn the truths that you have for us we pray Lord that you would apply each and every principle that you have for us into our lives Lord that we not just uh, be hearers this morning but Lord we uh, apply it and do what you've commanded us to do Lord as we uh, think about the upcoming days Lord that we would be wise in all that we do that we'd follow you and Lord we thank you for uh, this country we thank you for the freedoms that we do have we thank you for our leadership we lift them up to you today Lord as they uh, are making decisions each and every day that affect uh, all of us and Lord we just pray Lord that they would uh, start seeking you Lord we pray for uh, those that are on the front lines Lord we pray and lift them up to you and Lord ask you Lord to watch over protect them Lord, keep them safe as they continue to help uh, those that are sick. And Lord, we pray for quick recovery for those that are in the hospital at this time. And Lord, we pray for our church family. Lord, that you continue to protect and watch over them. And Lord, that you'd bring us back together to worship you corporately soon. And we give you all the praise and the glory for all that you have done. And Lord, we want to praise you now for what you will do in and through our lives. For it's in the name of names, the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis 16 will be there in just a moment. Today we're going to talk about choices and, and a caution about making choices when we're frustrated. Making choices when it seems like God is distant. Many times we are making choices each and every day that don't affect uh, much and it doesn't take much time or uh, much energy or much thought to make the choices. What time am I going to get up? What am I going to eat today? What am I going to put on? How am I going to comb my hair this, this morning? And, and those type of decisions don't impact the group or the church or other people uh, as much as other decisions. But many times there's major decisions that we make or are things we do and people look on the outside and they question, oh, we could have done this better and that better. Uh, as a, if you've ever coached a sport before, you know the parents uh, that are on the sidelines, they always know that the coach made the, the wrong call and they, they know that they could have done it better. But you know, when you're, in that when you're in that seat and you're making the decisions, you go with uh, what you think is best. We sit around and we talk about uh, the government, we talk about the decisions that are being made in Washington, the decisions that are being made on, on the state level, and, and we may not agree with uh, a lot of the decisions. We might say, why didn't they do this? Why don't they do it that way? And, and uh, they're not calling us for our opinions. So uh, they make the decisions and, and then we follow and we have to go about our day. But more... Uh, close to home, we're talking about decisions that we're making, decisions that we make that do impact other people. It impacts the life of, of the church. It impacts the furtherance of the gospel in this community and around the world. So we want to look at uh, major decisions that we're making. And, and the tendency is when, when we're uh, isolated like we are, and maybe we're not as in, encouraged in, in the things of the Lord, we're not around our brothers and sisters uh, as much, and maybe we've slacked off a little bit in our personal uh, 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 endeavor to get closer to the Lord, 
those are times where we got to caution and watch out of making decisions that will have a drastic impact on, on our lives and the lives of those around us. We see that in our text this morning. We have Abram and Sarah, his wife. God had given them a promise, and they got frustrated, and they're wondering, you know, what God uh, are you doing? And we'll pick up with that in Genesis chapter 16, and we'll read the first uh, 10 verses together. Genesis 16, verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bear him no children, and she had a handmaiden, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath re restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go into my maiden, and it may be that I may attain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, an Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she was conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Verse 5, And Sarai and Sarai, Said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. Verse 6, But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of shore. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maiden, whence comest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be uh, numbered for multitude. So here we have a decision that was made by Abram and Sarah that not only affected their lives and their marriage and their children, but it effect, has effects in the world even today. And the tendency is, is when we're distanced from God and promises that God has given us and we're reminded of these promises uh, together, that maybe they seem a distance. Maybe as Abram and Sarah were in the land for 10 years, Maybe these six, seven weeks that we've been isolated have just been a, a dry time in, in your life and you're about to make some decisions, but be careful of making decisions that would impact not just you, but the church and the effect of the gospel around the world. So we want to look at the first thing that they did in making the decisions and in our decision making is understand we never underestimate the power of God. Never underestimate the power of God. God had given Abram and Sarai this promise, but yet they waited, and ten years have gone by, and, and uh, she's a lot older, and Abram's a lot older, and then they start to question, well, maybe we have to do something. Maybe we need to help God out. You say, that sounds funny. Maybe we need to help God out. But how many times do we do the same thing? We, we claim the promises of God and we say, okay, God, this is what you want us to do. But then we find ways to manipulate. The one thing about this isolation and this time of being apart is as we seek God, we see there's been things even in the church that we, we look at and we look at, oh, this is success or, or we need to do this or at this program and that program. And we neglect seeking God or, or seeing what God would have us to do. And we get ahead of God. And that's right where we find Abram and Sarah right here. Is they, they have God's promise, but they get impatient and they start getting ahead of God. So first they concluded that God didn't want Sarah to have the child. They concluded that hey, it, it wasn't Sarah that was going to uh, bear the child. It was another means. We, we found, well, maybe God wanted us to use Hagar here. So he didn't state, uh, they didn't state all the information when they're making this, this decision. They didn't take in the fact that God spoke the world into existence. They didn't take in the fact that God can do the impossible. They didn't take in the fact that God said His ways aren't our ways. His ways are much higher than our ways. His ways are beyond even what we can think about. He knows what He's doing. 
But many times we question God. We say, well, I got this. I, I can do this, and, and I've got the answer, and this is how we're going to manipulate and, and put it together. So that's what we see they, they did. They came to the wrong conclusion. The wrong conclusion of, we've got to do something here. So God didn't need their help. And God does, that God's not looking for us to help them out. He's looking for us to just have trust in Him. That, that we understand that, God, you can do the impossible. A, as a church, we had, were looking and we had plans of, of this project and that, and we need to do this and that, and we look at it and say, man, now we can't do any of that right now. We're not even together as a church. But we can see that God is uh, still working and, and God is moving in our hearts. And I, I pray that you are, uh, realize that God can do the impossible. Even though at this point that we're not together, that God is still using the church. The church isn't these four walls. You and I are the church. We are the body of Christ. We still can serve. We can still proclaim the good news of the gospel. But you know, it seems funny that they would try to help God out. Many people do that today and they get into trouble. They start looking for love in the wrong places. Instead of waiting on God, they just, I just need to uh, find a relationship. I just need to find a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a mate. And they help him out instead of waiting on God to provide. In churches, we, we try to do things uh, to generate crowds. God didn't call us to just generate crowds. He called us to proclaim the gospel, to go out into the highways and the byways and share the good news and compel them to come in, compel them to tell them uh, the good news and show them their need. Our dependence is upon God and His Spirit to do a work. We see even in religion... Religion is trying to help God out and we, we make rules up and, and religions have made all these rules. You've got to do this and do that. God has given us the gospel. The good news is that Jesus Christ has offered us salvation. It was a gift that He has given to us. But we try to help them out and say, well, if you attend church and you, and you give this much money, then you're going to be in good standings with God. And that's not even found in the Scriptures. God is looking, where is your faith place? It's not placed in, in a religion or, or following a person or a movement. It's following after Him. When we abandon God's way, we are concluding that we know better than God. And, and here's Abram and, and Sarah, and put yourself in, in their shoes. They have been given a promise, and, and they're beyond natural uh, uh, childbearing years. And they've been in the land for 10 years and they, it's trying to figure it out. And finally they just said, this has got to be it. How many churches and how many of us have done the same thing? That instead of putting our complete faith and resting upon God, God said He will build His church. And we try to help Him out. We get ahead of, ahead of Him. So first of all, realize that God will, can and will do the impossible. So don't discount what God's promises. Don't discount what God is telling you. Listen to Him and wait upon the Lord. Realize that God has a purpose for every delay. God has a purpose for every delay in, in your life. Here, Sarah and uh, Abram's life had uh, been delayed. They've been there for 10 years. Sometimes God's delays are to make us holy. To, to work in our life, to, to work on our sanctification, to remove things out of our life. Sometimes God's delays are to prepare us for the task. I, I can look back over uh, my family's life and, and my life and see times that we just look to God and say, What are you doing? Why aren't you moving right now? Why, why isn't this happening? We've been praying and we're looking for you to do this right now. And in hindsight, it's 2020. We say, Man, Thank God God didn't move us when, he want, when we wanted to. Thank God God didn't do this and that. And He knew what He was doing. We can see, looking back, the hand of God. So sometimes God is just working in our life that we would trust Him uh, better, trust Him for the task at His hand. A lot of times God is using delays to strengthen our faith. 
What are we really dependent upon? Are we dependent upon the government to, to send us the money? Are we dependent upon the government to do this or that? Are we dependent upon God? They shared stories in the past of how God has worked in our life and when we've completely depended upon God for everything, how God has just taken care of every bit of our needs beyond our comprehension, beyond uh, what we could even have planned. We fill the Thanksgiving jar up of, of many things that just surprise us and say, where did that come from? And the only one to explain that where that came from was uh, from God. Maybe it was an encouraging note. Maybe it was a financial blessing. Maybe it was just uh, whatever, or a visitor at, at the time that we were praying and wanting God to do something. We go out visit and, and uh, hang out door hangers and, and come in and say, God's going to give us 10 visitors Sunday and come back. And nobody joined us that week. And then when we least expect it, then visitors walk through the door and we're like, all right, there it is, God, perfect timing. Be faithful to what God has called us to do and God will do what He said He would do. You know, sometimes what you're going through and your delay in your life is for those that are watching. It's because there's those around you that need to see the hand of God. They need to see how God provided for you, how God protected you, how God uses this in your life. We've seen that through this virus already within our church family, how God has used this uh, in, in people's lives to show His hand of protection. Sometimes God's waiting to give His best to see if we really trust Him. I think a, a familiar passage of Scripture where uh, the children of uh, Israel were going in and God told them to uh, not take of anything but bring all the gold and, and uh, the precious jewels, bring it all into the, to the collection for the, the house of the Lord. But don't take anything for yourself. But there was one. His man was Achan and he took uh, of the spoils and he took it and hid it in his tent and then the children of Israel go to battle and they lose and all of a sudden uh, Joshua's crying out, the Lord, what, what happened? I don't understand. And God reveals their sin in the camp. And they go throughout the camp and they find out that Achan had taken of the spoil. Not only did Achan lose his life, but his whole family lost his life. And those that were killed in the first the battle at Ai lost their life. Their, his sin affected many. But what Achan didn't see is God had his best if he would have just waited. If he would have just listened to the instructions that God had, God had his best. And sometimes God's delays are only explained that God knows what he's doing. He knows. We don't know and maybe we'll never figure out what he delayed. But it's a great lesson to learn. A lesson that we need to learn in this day and age is that we need to wait on the Lord. We all get anxious and we're all ready to, to do this and that and we're ready to, to get back together. But sometimes we just need to realize that we need to wait on the Lord. Turn with me to Psalm 27. The psalmist says in Psalm 27, verse 14, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. How often do we wait on the Lord? How often do we just sit and say, Lord, I'm waiting for your answer? Or do we do a microwave prayer and we prayed it and say, man, it should have been done in 10 seconds and, and you didn't give me the answer, so here's what I must do. No, he said, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. Psalm 37, verse 9. He says, For evildoers will be cut off, but those that wait on the Lord shall... Uh, wait on the Lord, they will inherit the land. Those that wait on the Lord will inherit the land. Remember the children of Israel, they sent 12 spies into the promised land. God had promised them the land. And ten of them come back and say, the land is just like He said, and it's, it's great. It's flowing with milk and honey, and the grapes are, are enormous, and, and it's great. But we cannot go in the land because there's giants in the land. But two said, God has given it to us. We need to go. And what happens is they spend years, 40 years, wandering in the wilderness while that generation dies off, and a new generation rises up that's going to trust God. Wait on the Lord, 
Uh, we need to seek the Lord when we're waiting. Lamentations 3, verse 25. Lamentations 3, 25 says this, The Lord is good unto them that wait for Him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for Him, to the soul that seeketh Him. So while we're waiting, it's not just sitting around doing nothing. He says here, the soul that seeketh Him. So while we're waiting on the Lord, while we're waiting for an explanations of things, we need to be seeking Him, studying the Word of God. We've had great Bible studies even during this time of getting into God's Word. We're not using a curriculum or a program. We're just opening up the Bible and going through the Bible and discussing what God's Word has said and how it applies into our life. Study His Word. Seek answers from His Word. Claim His promises in His Word. Spend time in prayer. Prayer, we've talked about, it's one thing we talk about the most and practice the least, but we need to be a church that prays. We need to be a people known for praying. Taking our prayers to the Lord, every issue. Pray about what's going on right now. Pray for answers. Pray for things to be lifted up and pray for a time that we can get back together. But as you're praying for that time, pray that when we get back together that we would see uh, all that God has done and, and see a, a greater passion and zeal for the things of God. Spend time meditating on God. It's easy. Uh, to meditate and, and focus on the things uh, on, on the radio and things that are on Fox News and this news channel and all that's going on there. We need to focus and meditate on God. God, what are you doing? God, what am I supposed to do? God, what do you want me to do right now? So in this time when we're, and we're trying to make decisions, we're trying to do this and that, we need to wait on the Lord and know that God's timing is perfect. His time was perfect when He came to this earth, when He, he lived it and uh, as sinless life and He died on the cross. It was a perfect time. It was in the fullness of time that God did that for you and I. Waiting also involves taking action at the right time. The Bible says there's a time to, uh, the time to plow, a time to sow, and a time to reap. Now, if you farmed or you have a garden, you know that the exciting times are, are planting. Right now, we've been to uh, getting some plants and getting ready to put some plants in the ground. We've got some lettuce in the garden, and it's exciting. You put that in. And the other exciting part is harvest. But it's that time in between of waiting. You, you've plowed the ground. You've d did the soil. You put the seed in the ground. You watch the stuff start to sprout. But now you've got to wait weeks, sometimes months, to, to get the harvest. So there's a time we need to watch. There's a time we wait on the Lord. There's a time we need to be tilling soil. There's a time that we need to plant. And there's going to be a time of, of harvest. Waiting on the Lord is just like that. And there's a time where we're just growing spiritually. Are you using this time wisely? Are, are we using this time to, to grow, to feed ourselves? Maybe we've been just used to being fed and coming to Sunday school and going to Bible study and, and listening to preaching, and God just wants us to take time to, to feed ourselves, to get into the Word of God and study, take some action during this waiting time. When God is silent, we shouldn't panic. God is still on the throne. God is still working. Listen to this quote, or this little story about a preacher in New England, Brooks. He was agitated, and his friend asked, what, what is the trouble? And Brooks replied, the trouble is, I'm in a hurry, but God's not. And that, that reflects a lot of us in, in our prayer life. And we're making a decision. Uh, we, we wanted to build that building and we were in a hurry and we had the plans drawn up and, and, and uh, for the Sunday school building we had it all ready and the economy just went down. We had to wait. It was frustrating. We, we said we need this for future ministry. We need this to, to reach out and we need this space. We had to wait a couple years. And God gave it to us at the right time. And we had the people in place and the finances were there. And we were able to put it up and, and go. There's other things that we need to do and we need to be doing it. And we need to realize that we need to be right with God so we can move forward. God's delays 
show us his wisdom. We can see God's wisdom in the delays. But consider, when we make a decision, we get in a hurry and we try to hurry up God, look at the consequences. Chapter 16, verse 5 and 6. And Sarah said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. <laughs> yeah, it was wrong. I have given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I would dis was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleases thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. See, delays are necessary, and we need to wait on the Lord. But if we get too anxious, we get too much in a, a, a hurry, we're just like Abram and Sarah. It, it's just like taking the little children out to the store, and we go into the store, and we're down, and, uh, and maybe it's the store that has all the fancy dishes or has all the glassware uh, in this area. Just puts my nerves, I'm on edge. I want to sit in the car and lock the doors. And, and they're running around. And you know where they go. They right, right go to the most expensive, most fragile pieces. And they want to look at it and shake the shelf. And you're just, get away. Go look at bath towels and stay away from the dishes that will break. But we're just the same way. We get anxious and we go to things and we call, cause trouble. What happened in, in uh, Abram and Sarah's life? Their marriage was affected. That's obvious to you and I. It's obvious. We can see the effect that that was a bad idea. I don't think anybody watching says that's a good idea. It's going to affect their marriage. Imagine, here's a, his wife, Abram's wife. They've been together, and now she's, he's with some other lady. They're sh sharing. That, that's not going to work out. It never has and never will work out. And here we see... Hagar, she has to leave. She feels that she has to leave. She says she's been treated so harshly. You could imagine how she was being treated by Sarah. You imagine the treatment that was going on, and she feels that she has to leave. So we see, we see the consequence on their marriage. We see the consequence between the handmaiden and uh, Abram and the handmaiden and Sarah. And then we see a worldwide consequences. Because this was not the child that God had planned. This was not God's plan. And through this relationship, we have Ishmael. Ishmael, the, the father of the Arab, Arab people. And from that time now, we still have that conflict between the Arabs and the Jewish people. When they tried to help God, when they tried to help God out, it had consequences <clears throat> beyond what they even, even thought would have had. If they would have just waited on God, we can look at it and say, that didn't make sense. Who would have come up with such a crazy plan? But how many times do we do the same thing and we make decisions and we don't understand and we realize that there's consequences? That it's not only going to affect me, but it's going to affect my family. It's not only going to affect me and my family, but it's going to affect my church family. It's not even going to affect me, my family, and church family. It's going to affect our missionaries around the world. If I just drop out, or I stop going and being a part of the church, or I stop giving, I stop doing this or that, it's going to impact broadly the work that God has. So we see the consequences of it. They disregarded the things of the Lord. Look at what has happened in our world today. They've taken God out of school. They've taken God out of the, even the courthouses. We've removed God and any kind of a fear of, of God at all. And look at what has taken across our country. The violence, the... the um, uh, disregard for authority. All that is out there and it's a consequence because we don't fear the Lord. And we, we see what has happened here in the life of Abram and Sarah when they didn't fear the Lord, they didn't count the consequences. When Christians just sit back and they make a decision not to be involved in what's going on, well, I, I'm not going to vote this year because I don't like the candidates. By making that kind of decision, you're making a decision to stay out of it and then look what we have. 
We're not going to speak up when, when they're taking God out of school. We're not going to speak up when they're not allowing our children to, to pray in public. Not, can't even talk about God in school. You know what we did? When, when our uh, uh, first grader, I think your first grade, she was in first grade, our second daughter was in school and she had gotten saved. She realized that she was a sinner and needed a Savior. and She went to school and she was excited about it. And her teacher told her, we don't talk about that here. We, that, we don't talk about uh, God here. That's the same school that they had a Christmas program that celebrated everything but the birth of Christ. But they don't talk about it. We, we reap the consequences of not being involved here. They did not count the consequences here. But notice something else. No one was willing to take the blame. We, as, we, we, we're good at blaming everybody else. Here's Sarah. Says, Abram, it's your fault. Abram say, no, Sarah, it's your fault. You told me to take her. <coughs> and here's Hagar saying, it's both of your fault. I didn't have nothing to do with this plan. You told me to do this. Nobody takes, blame for, takes the blame for anything. They want to pass a book. I, we joke around here and say, you know, why do we work in twos? So we have somebody else to blame. We're going to paint. We're going to do this. Well, somebody else has to come. So why? Well, if we spill on the carpet, it was somebody else's fault. It, we always are joking about that. But the reality is that's how we operate in, in life. We're always focusing on it's somebody else's fault. We share in the gospel and tell them how much God loves them. And, and, and they look at their surroundings. They know that they've made a mess of their life. And they say, well, it's not my fault. It's the way I was born. It was the way my parents treated me. It's, it's, I'm just a product of my, my environment. It's, it's not my fault. But we all have a choice to make. Just as Abram and Sarah had a choice to make to, to trust God and follow God, everybody has a choice to make. And we've got to take responsibility. When we look and try to share the gospel and tell people all have sinned, people look at you and say, no, I'm not a sinner. And then you have to convince them to show them that we have all sinned. That's what the Bible says. And then they realize when you go through that, yeah, I am a sinner. But they don't want to take responsibility for it. And lastly, we want to look at the, the, the great part of this passage here in cha uh, chapter 16, verses 7 through 9, through the end. An angel of the angel of the Lord found her by the fountain. Here's Hagar that had been gone gone away because they had ran her out. Found her in the wilderness by a fountain in the way of Shur, and he said unto Hagar, Sarah's maiden, Whence comest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Remember, that you're never beyond the reach of God's care and comfort. Here's Hagar because of her circumstances and the way she's been treated. She said, the only answer to this is I've got to flee. But we see God finding her. We see God bringing compassion and saying, you need to go back. You need to go back to Sarah. You need to go back to... The... What is he said? That don't even make sense. You don't... God, how, how is being tra treated? We see something in the life of Hagar here. She trusted God. It, not just her child, but it was also Abram's child. And, and here she's out wandering and, and the Lord meets her there and says, hey, go back. She brings comfort to her. You know, there's not any mistake that we have made that we cannot be forgiven by God. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but He has offered us forgiveness. As a lost person, He's offered to forgive us of all our sins and give us a home in heaven. Here He finds Hagar and He says, go back. Live amongst the people that you just fled from. Was everything back to normal? Was every, everything in Abram and Sarah's house just hunky-dory and say, alright, welcome back? No. But what it did was cause them to get back to trusting God. We've, we, we've all made mistakes. We've all done things outside of God's will. We need to get back to the point where we're trusting God and we're waiting on Him to give His answer to our situation. Are you trying to get ahead of God? Are you growing weary right now in isolation and 
neglecting the things of God. Here's the caution. Here's where Abram and Sarah was. Time had gone by and they hadn't seen God's hand. They hadn't seen God's promise come through. Don't neglect God. Continue to press forward. Continue to draw closer to God and, and desire to hear that answer. And God's going to give us that answer in His timing. So a couple of takeaways. Always trust God's wisdom, not our own. Always trust God's wisdom. Turn to God and ask God and wait on His answer. When, he get, when you get an answer and you, you're questioning, am I making the right decision? Talk to your brothers and sisters. After you've sought God and, and you seek God, then talk to other Christians and, and run it by them. Imagine Abram and Sarah in their life and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. <coughs> Somebody might say, hey, that's a bad idea. Abram, you're not gonna, your marriage isn't going to be the same. It's not going to work, Sarai. Think about the consequences. And remember to be patient. Remember to wait on the Lord. He's going to renew you. He's going to give you what He's promised. His promises are true. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Just trust Him. Each and every day, sit down and just cry out to God and wait on Him. Draw close to Him during this time. Don't make any rash decisions. Don't do anything drastically. Just wait on God and, and you'll see what God will do in and through your life and the life of His church. And we look forward to the day and see a great time of what God has done in, in our lives together. That we get together and, and be able to vibrantly worship Him because we spent these times seeking Him individually. Let's pray. Lord God, we praise You and thank You for all that You have done. We thank You for Your Word. Lord, I thank You for the life of Abram and Sarah. And Lord, how You did give them that child. Lord, it was beyond their, their uh, natural ability. And Lord, You showed Yourself in their life. And Lord, we desire to see You do the same in our lives. Lord, teach us through this lesson to, to wait on You. And Lord, in our waiting, not to just sit idle, but to, to passionately pursue Your things that You have for us. Lord, I pray for those out there that are like Hagar. Maybe they're running. Lord, they've been uh, close, surrounded around other Christian people, but yet they're, now they're running in, in uh, shame or in sin. Lord, show them your love. Show them your compassion. Draw them in. Bring them back into the, the church house to, when we can gather together. And Lord, show them your forgiveness and your restoration. And Lord, we give you the praise and glory for all that you're going to do in and through your people. And we give all the glory to you. And ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.